Part 1. Get Ready Chapter 1. A Not-So-Brief History of the Voiceover Industry The Past If you're like me, you're someone who remembers a media landscape much, much different than the one we're living in now. Saturday mornings laying on the floor in front of a TV, watching cartoons. Getting home from school and being greeted by sitcom reruns from the generations before packed with advertisements for soap, soup, and salad dressing. Or game shows, same ads. Or the tail end of a soap opera, mostly the same ads, plus control top pantyhose and cake mix. Frigid winter mornings, listening to the kitchen radio while eating your cereal, waiting to hear the magic words, blowing and drifting, that heralded the announcement that schools were closed due to winter weather. I grew up in the Midwest. Feel free to insert your own geographically specific radio-announced joy-inducing no-school environmental event here. Hiding a plastic and often overheating transistor radio under your pillow, listening for an opportunity to call in a request or win tickets to an event from your favorite radio station. Being picked up from an after-school function and driven home to the ever-so-exciting business news and stock market report because your dad wanted to know how his A or B company shares were doing. Sneaking down to the basement rec room and watching the creature feature, falling asleep, and waking up to the station sign-off, with old glory waving in majestic grainy slow motion, while some disembodied voice said, This concludes our broadcast day, and ran down the broadcast licensing and transmitter info. Insert wistful, nostalgic sigh here. Those were the days. Well, that is, if you were born before 1980 or so. The generations that followed saw a sea change, even if they didn't know it was happening. But for us Gen Xers, the above little fond remembrances and warm fuzzy memories all share at least one thing. They were all powered by the human voice. To be more specific, they all employed voiceovers or voice acting. Advertising, public service announcements, game show sponsorships, advertising, DJs, announcers, cartoons. Did I mention advertising? Even the visual medium of television was powered by the human voice. It would be nothing without it. It wouldn't even exist. Broadcast television was a direct descendant of your grandpa's old RCA cabinet radio set that he kept in his garage all those years and would play the golden oldies AM radio station through on those scorching hot 4th of Julys while undercooking the chicken and overcooking everything else. Radio was my first love. Other kids my age wanted to be astronauts, football stars, or maybe evil Knievel. Me? I wanted to be the voice on the radio telling you that the S&P 500 was trending steady, the Dow was down, but the Nasdaq was really where the action was. One day, when I was knee-high to a mic stand, my dad brought home a Panasonic, was there any other kind back then, cassette recorder from work, and let me mess with it. I'm sure he was expecting a bunch of dirty words and fart noises, both simulated as well as the lucky real one, from his eight-year-old son when he next sat at his office desk and hit play. Imagine his surprise when instead he was brought up to date on the Son of Sam killings, hot off the AP newswire. But first, a word from our sponsor, your friendly neighborhood Oldsmobile dealership. I dreamed of being an announcer, not even a DJ, yet. I wanted to be the guy whose voice everyone knew. You didn't even know their name, but you sure knew that voice. By the age of about six, I had already started to actively recognize the major VO talent of the day on the shows we regularly watched, but was now beginning to spot on other shows elsewhere on TV. For example, round about 1978, I noticed that the voice on Afternoon Jeopardy sounded suspiciously like the voice introducing Saturday Night Live, Don Pardo. Later in the 80s, when I went to the movies, if it was a trailer for an upcoming Paramount picture, it nearly always had the dude going, in a world where... And it sounded suspiciously like the guy kicking off America's Most Wanted, Don LaFontaine. And Daggett from the Nickelodeon animated show Angry Beavers 
uh, an adult guilty pleasure show of mine, sounded a lot like the wacky insane alien from another guilty pleasure, Space Invader Zim, Richard Horvitz. Hey, that other beaver Norbert was a dead ringer for the talking cat on ABC sitcom Sabrina the Teenage Witch, who in turn sounded a lot like that one dude talking about pretty much anything NFL-related on ESPN, Nick Bacay. I started suspecting that this thing was, in fact, an actual thing people actually did. And once I figured that out, the world and my ears started opening up. This is going to sound really remedial and obvious, but if something needs to be done on the regular, there's a need for people that are ready, willing, and able to do that thing, well, on the regular. The world would be a very inefficient place if every job that needed to be done had to be done by a first-timer. It suddenly occurred to me that there was a particular profession for this voice thing, be it publicly announcing something, advertising something, or even being the voice of a character in a cartoon. Some person was doing that, with their voice, and being paid. Uh, I wanted to do that. I needed to be doing that, and, and... I had absolutely no idea whatsoever how to even begin to pursue the doing of that. The only real clue I had was that it was likely related to broadcasting. DJing, weather and traffic reports on the radio, news reading, that sort of thing. By the 80s, most TV stations owned radio stations, and they likely shared staff. Maybe that was an inroad. DJing always seemed cool, and by the time I was a teenager, music had become pretty important to my life. This is a bit of a side road, but yes, I had dreams of being a disc jockey. As a matter of fact, I actually did a bit of time on air, but was more successful as a club DJ for many years. I do still consider myself a DJ, but interestingly enough, that really doesn't enter into the voiceover discussion much. Back then, getting into that business was as much or more a mystery to young me as getting into that announcer thing. I had no real grasp of how one went about it. The 80s did see a plethora of broadcast and recording technology schools, but they were mostly fly-by-night scams. By the time I was coming of age, I'd made the jump to the more practical and obviously achievable dream of becoming a rock star. Flash forward a few more years, and Rock God gave way to local roadie and part-time college musician and DJ. That did get me acquainted with a few legitimate working radio DJs in the Midwest, which did get me behind the mic in studio a few times, which did allow me to cut a few spots that went straight to nowhere. Shortly thereafter, I entered college, where one would assume I would have gone into mass communications. Yeah, my major was philosophy with a minor in writing and literature. At best, my DJ experience and vocation did give me a few skills that carried over, but honestly, they weren't nearly as important as my avocation. Music. All throughout high school and college, a close high school buddy of mine and I, along with other friends and accomplices, would occupy our time and our parents' unused storage spaces with building makeshift and not-so-makeshift studios where we would write and, more importantly, record our own material. Four-track cassette recorders were becoming accessible to people, and some real and legitimate music was hitting the world from people's basements, living rooms, and other areas of their sleeping arrangements. It was exciting. It was affordable. It was accomplishable. And at times, it was aimless, musically frustrating, and self-indulgent. But all said, it was those times that were the most important of all to me, although I didn't know it at the time. Hours sitting around with no workable musical ideas, waiting on a late bandmate. What to do? Run tape, up the mics, and act stupid. Hours performing goofy, stupid, fake call-in shows, recording ins, outs, ramps, bumpers, and faux station IDs. Man, this basement sounds so echoey. Got any blankets, dude? Maybe that'll help. Those halcyon late nights with my buddy, trying to generate anything even close to listenable, were the proof of concept stage of my current voiceover career. It illustrated to me that a time was soon coming where high-quality audio recordings could be done at home, at a reasonable cost, with a minimum amount of gear, in a less-than-professional acoustic environment, and still have a remotely polished sound. And as a matter of fact, 
We became so accomplished at home recording. My primary songwriting partner and I both got multiple tracks aired on the two biggest FM rock stations in our market multiple times. Interestingly, we're both still at it to this day. I do voiceovers, and he records commercial music aimed at broadcast placement. We're still in touch, and we've even helped each other out professionally over the years. And we're still doing it independently from our own homes, and yes, by most measures, somewhat successfully. Neither one of us is driving a Bugatti, but neither of us is in a Pinto either. The key elements to either of us becoming independent producers, important term kids, we'll cover that shortly, is 1. The advent of the personal computer. 2. The improvement of both computer memory and processor power. And 3. Of course, the internet. I'm going to keep the tech nerd dive pretty shallow here, but let's dig into that. As mentioned above, my father would often bring home, for the time, pretty cutting-edge technology for me to play with. I was the youngest of six kids, and by the time I was growing up and coming of age, most parents were starting to understand that there may be more to their child's future career path than just being a doctor, lawyer, accountant, or possibly taking over the family business. Technology was rapidly becoming more prevalent and more visible in modern life every day. And I believe my father saw the importance of that for me in my future, and so he saw the wisdom of me being exposed to it early. He worked as management in a massive manufacturing plant with a major foot in the automotive industry. And in the 70s and 80s, they were doing everything in their power to keep up with the post-war Japanese automotive manufacturing juggernaut. His company had started instituting new training programs, modeled after Japan's success, to onboard new employees and fast-track them into manufacturing roles, processes, and best practices. His plant even had their own AV recording studio, and he would often bring home all manner of tape recorders, cameras, and even video recorders. Oh, and computers. That was the game-changer. From the moment I learned how to switch it on, I intrinsically understood that this device was likely the thing that would allow me to record and edit sound recordings in the exact same way I could edit text or a picture. Didn't know the how, didn't know the when, but I knew. It took longer than I either wanted it to or suspected it would, but of course, it did happen. The advent of the internet a generation later was the accelerant that really got the fire raging. The ability to compress a massive audio file down to a manageable size with minimal loss of fidelity was key. By the early to mid-90s, the technology was becoming available, to those who could afford it, that made high-end audio recording and broadcasting from home feasible. At the time, most people merely surfing the net were using dial-up modems for their internet access. But telecom companies were starting to deploy higher speed options like ISDN, that is Integrated Services Digital Network, and ADSL or Asymmetric Digital Subscriber Line solutions that would handle the heavy bandwidth demands of data and sound transmission, either digitally created at the source or analog to digital to analog, that rivaled the gold standard of the day, CD quality sound. Numerous popular broadcasters of that time, most notably the late Art Bell of Coast to Coast AM, were broadcasting directly from their homes, in Bell's case, from Pahrumpf, Nevada, on the Nevada-California border, truly the middle of nowhere, and creating media empires. Moreover, many of those famous voices I mentioned above, like Don LaFontaine, exploited the power of new telecom offerings, in his case ISDN, and set up a studio in his Hollywood Hills home, working from there until his passing in 2008. Home was now a fully legitimate place to do voiceover work, and The Don very successfully illustrated that by earning millions of dollars in the latter years of his life. Thanks, Don. We owe you. The Internet also brought something else into the mix. Content. This, my friends, is where the whole game changes. Up until this point, if you were wanting to do voiceovers, you were aiming yourself at a few different targets. Commercial advertising, broadcasting, and or in-studio live voice work before everything was migrated to tape delay production. Or possibly a very niche market like books on tape or industrial film narration. On the timeline, we're roughly up to the new millennium. 
The internet in people's homes is growing in ubiquity. People are carrying groovy flip phones in their pockets that have magnitudes more computational power than the computers that landed men on the moon. Additionally, these phones are now able to start accessing resources on the internet themselves. Email, SMS, text messages. It's all very new and very exciting. But even this is only the nascent beginnings of what is to come just a few short years later. The Present, Part 1 As I write this, the present is a very challenging and interesting place. The nation and the world are going through one of the most challenging times modern humanity has ever known, the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Legions of people who used to grab their coffee on the go and head out onto the freeway for their daily commute to their brick-and-mortar office are now grabbing that desperately needed caffeine out of their drip maker on their commute from the bedroom to the living room while stepping over cat toys. That is, if they're one of the fortunate ones still employed and now working remotely, also known as from home. The other significant chunk of folks impacted are either furloughed and out of a job, or those deemed essential workers delivering the rest of us sheltering in place all of our groceries, webcams, instant yeast, and precious, precious toilet paper. Either of the latter two circumstances are uncomfortable, nervous places to ever find oneself. And as an aside, my best wishes to you and yours. Stay strong. The first finds a person out of work with massive challenges in getting another job or qualifying for or retaining unemployment benefits. The second finds one literally risking their life and or collaterally the lives of their family members to stay earning a living through a global health emergency and in doing so, either by choice, by necessity, or some combination thereof, possibly contributing to its spread. Both are serious situations that would weigh heavy on anyone's mind. I bring up the pandemic for a few different reasons, and they all play into the questions revolving around home voice work. At the same time, I aim to have this book stand on its own, irrespective of any pandemic or other national or global issue. But to button up pandemic talk, we'll distill it down to, there are a lot of people considering or possibly reconsidering their employment situation right now for a whole raft of reasons. Maybe you have that stimulus check sitting on your kitchen table and are trying to crystal ball a very murky future. Maybe you're out of a job, feeling desperate, and thinking of anything you could possibly do to earn a living from your fifth-floor one-bedroom apartment. Maybe you're no longer comfortable with the idea of being out and about in public, face-to-face -face with who knows who or who knows what. Maybe you're like me and have the personal honor of being in a high-risk group situation yourself or possibly your family or both. Maybe it's just all that free time you're going crazy from while in lockdown. Each one of those are very significant, valid reasons for any person to be considering other avenues of financial stability, viability, or employment. The good news is, voiceover work can be lucrative, rewarding, fulfilling, and legitimate work. The bad news is, it takes a long time to get there. As I said earlier, I'm not here to blow sunshine up your anything. I don't have a stake in the game of you or your success. You've been kind enough to buy this audiobook of mine, and at an absolute minimum, for the price of admission, I owe you the truth of what this business is, what it takes to gain traction in it, and what it can provide you in return. I'm also no Don LaFontaine with the level of success, fame, and bank to say, I'm on top of the world, ma. I get by. Voiceover work pays some, if not most, of my bills. I drive a beat-up 1994 pickup with a cracked windshield that needs some work but runs, has gas in it, and is titled, licensed, and insured. That's success to me. It may not, however, be success to you. It may not be enough to float your boat, or right it, or keep it from sinking. So as we move forward, be okay with the hard truths I'm going to lay out there in front of you at times. Be willing to say, yeah, now's probably not a good time for me, just as much as you might want to say, let's do this thing. There are ways you can test the water without taking too big a risk. We'll cover those as we move forward. For now, though, 
let's look a bit further into the future, again, through the lens of the past. The Present, Part 2. Part 2 of this examination is in no way a standalone monolithic thing. It is a continuation of the discussion of where we're finding ourselves now with regards to the home voicework industry. It's interesting that I started this book, or a version of it, back in 2017-18, but I'm now finally finishing it up in 2021-22 in the midst of all this tumult. For the most part, nothing much has changed as far as my message or any of the practical information goes. But on the other hand, everything has changed, obviously. And interestingly enough, it's not all bad news. The pandemic has been a very interesting teacher when it comes to our modern lives. What we truly need versus what we can do without. How we work, how we entertain ourselves, how we stay connected as people, as a culture, and as humanity on whole. In the past 30 years, the internet has gone from a nerdy technological curiosity used mostly by a select academic few to send text-based research back and forth with the ability to mark up the work of colleagues, to a vital network of communication that connects nearly every point of the globe to almost any other, literally from pole to pole, and every point imaginable in between, and is being used by everyone from bakers to bankers, sanitation workers to superstars, researchers to recluses, and almost any other conceivable person with access to the requisite technology, which itself has become more and more affordable and accessible. We won't go further down that rabbit hole, but an aspect of this major shift in the way we communicate is a key element in any discussion to pursue home voice work, or voice work of any kind for that matter, and it was mentioned earlier. It's a new name for a concept, the product of which we've enjoyed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Content. Content is a new way of referring to nearly anything and everything we can or do consume as information or entertainment. News is content. Network television is content. Radio programming, movies, books, and talk shows are content. All these classic media offerings fit the idea of content. Now, I use the word classic here because, generally speaking, they all existed before the dawn of the Internet age, and for the most part were widely available to the majority of humanity with a low-to-no barrier access threshold. Now, in this new age of instant global communication, content has taken on a much broader meaning. A combination of affordable production technology, the ubiquity of high-speed Internet access, highly effective digital data compression, and recording and editing software has in the past decade or so united with both the rise of ultra-powerful smartphone ownership and the growing presence of social media and streaming platforms in people's lives to recreate the worldwide media landscape in a way that lets anyone with a smartphone, a halfway decent computer, and an internet connection produce media that rivals, if not beats, most anything a big media network or production company can put out. In short, Anyone with a phone in their pocket that's less than about five years old can produce media that's near broadcast quality and get it out to the entire world. And the world is gobbling it up. People are not just becoming internet famous. They're becoming legitimately famous, for good or not so much, because of the content they create and the social media channels they operate through. We are talking mini and not so mini media empires here. And the pandemic crisis has made these offerings all the more critical and all the more visible. You can only watch so many movies, binge so many shows, and play so many games while in self-isolation before the standard media well starts to run a bit dry. People have flocked to streaming platforms to find other sources of entertainment, distraction, information, education, or connection. And thanks to a combination of affordable technology and the global reach of the internet, for every interest, hobby, news niche, or entertainment subculture, there's a content offering somewhere on the old interwebs that will happily cater to them. Just like, smash that thumbs up button, and don't forget to subscribe. YouTube, Twitch, Audible, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Amazon, TikTok. Each one, alone or in conjunction with others, has seen exponential growth over the past decade. And this growth has been by and large powered by otherwise average people deciding to make their own media offerings and float them out to the world at large. 
Okay, great. What does this all have to do with me? You might ask. Well, this is where you actually come into the picture, as it were. We as media consumers still have a mental model that we measure content quality by. Slick visuals and graphics, high quality music, and presenter personality all add up to an idea of quality that we use to decide the worth of the content and our desire to follow or consume it. And while a lot of these qualities can either be reproduced with or aided by technology, one thing really cannot be replicated or replaced. The human voice. Yes, speech synthesis has come a long way too, but it's just nowhere near what any one of us would accept as an introduction to our favorite show telling us about the big sale at the local car lot or commentating on our favorite sport ball team. We can barely tolerate Siri giving us directions or Alexa telling us the weather. And that's where independent voice talents come into the landscape. As the number of content offerings rise, so too does the need for voice talent as a support and enhancement for these new media offerings. You can have all the flashy graphics, 3D modeled logos, and banging beats you want on your ultra-polished streaming content or product walkthrough video, but if the voice you hear telling you what's coming up next sounds anything other than top-notch broadcast quality, people by and large tend to immediately judge your content as less than or amateur. And when that happens, your credibility is impacted. And credibility is everything. Even content that goes for a stripped-down, lo-fi approach often does so with more of an eye on quality than one might expect. Lo-fi doesn't equal low quality. Lo-fi is as much a brand in and of itself as it is some kind of accidental result of production inability. Said differently, even things that we want to appear a bit loose and DIY want to do so with a consistent level of production that consumers will judge as high quality. Barring deafness or some other significant hearing impediment, the human voice is one thing that we all know and judge immediately. There are voices we like and those we don't. Manners of speech and diction that we understand and those that make comprehension more difficult. Ways of speaking that engage us as listeners and those that put us off. Be it cultural training, repetition and regular exposure, or other impacting factors, we know what qualities we listen for when it comes to vocal communication. In much the same way that as a maker, I often have trouble explaining how to employ a given technique or process someone else wants to learn from me, but I can show them what right looks like. We all tend to know what right sounds like. Everybody is listening for right. And content producers are near always looking for somebody to provide that right sound that they themselves cannot. And that's where independent voice artists come in. Maybe that's where you come in. But what does it take to get into this new world of content creation and independent production? How do you learn what right sounds like and how to produce that? And can it pay your bills? Well, it's time to start finding out.